Good evening, everyone. My name is Juliane Camfield. I'm the director here at Deutsches Haus at NYU. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to our panel discussion, The Politics of Language, with Siri Hustvedt, Masha Gessen, and Uli Baer, who will moderate. This is our third and last panel in our conference, What's Going On? Reflections. Yeah, <laughs> reflections on truth, democracy, politics, and language. Yes, and uh, what the hell is going on? And please, you guys, you, you will edit this out of the tape. And we're taping this, so please leave if you don't want to be taped. Now is your last chance. So, so what the hell is going on? I don't know. And that's why these guys are here, because I don't know. But but I think many of us, and perhaps also our distinguished panelists, but I hope not, but I think many of us have felt a strong and profound sense of discombobulation since last year, and perhaps even the really prescient ones since before November 8th or November 9th last year. And um, together with that sense of discomb discombobulation, a sense of um, experiencing being and perhaps being lost in the quote-unquote upside-down world. Um, and I think um, maybe this is why Stranger Things is so popular these days. Stranger Things, if you don't get the reference, is a bizarre TV series that you should be watching. I think it's interesting. Uh, and there is an upside-down world, which is very similar to what we live in currently. There's also some kind of weird monster lurking about, and uh, I feel in our parallel universe that we have been experiencing recently, we think we have a better sense of who or what that monster is, but are we correct? I don't know. Um, but what, does, what role does language play in our strange new world. I don't know that either, but again, I hope light will be shed by the distinguished thinkers, authors, uh, uh, and uh, panelists here tonight. But one thing that came to my mind as I, as I was walking my daughter, my young daughter, to school this morning, and she had a spelling test coming up, which focused on homonyms, which I thought was rather strange in second grade, but here you go. This is an advanced country. The education and system is excellent, so seven-year-olds learn about homonyms. So, And she's having a hard time with the homonyms, and the homonyms that mostly troubled her were break and break, B-R-A-K-E and B-R-E-A-K, and I'm a bad speller in English, so that for me is completely, just saying these things is difficult. So she's confused about it. We're rushing to school. I'm thinking of this event, and I'm trying to explain to her how to spell this. And I'm saying, OK, think about the bike break, and think about the bike breaking or not breaking. And But she's like, my bike is breaking. And anyway, so we had these conversations. And then I'm like, OK, think about the teacup breaks. And she's like, which teacup? And anyway, so we have this conversation. By the end, and I will get to my point, bear with me. By the end of the conversation, I can't spell either word anymore. She can spell it. I think she will have flunked the spelling test. And I'm utterly confused which break signifies which break. Uh, and I think this is pretty much what we experience now when we <laughs> read the news, listen to people, what what are they saying? What are they talking about? They're using words we think we know, but they seem to mean something else, or we understand something else, or um, it is just really discombobulating. So this is the long and the short of my mini introduction. So uh, uh, we'll all think about how to spell these words, and we'll find out what they mean. Um, in the meantime, let me thank a few institutions and individuals. The DAD, the German Academic Exchange Service, especially Nina Lemons and Michael Tomanek for the continuing support. Of course, our distinguished speakers to make the time in their busy schedules to be here tonight and share their thoughts on a serious topic, even though I'm making fun of it, but I just like 
to do that. Um, and my wonderful staff, especially Zara, it's been a pleasure to work with you on this conference. This has been a lot of work and difficulties and challenges, which we will share with you later over a glass of wine, because there are some people will badmouth. No, never. Um, and I want to thank our unpaid interns, our wonderful student workers. I want to thank you, the audience, for coming here tonight. Remember, you can also learn German here at Deutsches Haus if you dare, D-E-R, or if you want to feel good, V. I-E-L, <laughs> uh, as our slogans say. Uh, so uh, enroll for a class for the holidays, because the holidays will be miserable anyway. Um, <laughs> so there. Come to a Deutsches house, I'll time. And also, speaking of the holidays, we have Ziris and Masha's book, last book on sale here. So for $20, special discount price for your loved ones for the holidays to depress them even further. Read those books. And uh, now it is my great pleasure to hand things over to my distinguished uh, colleague and good friend of Deutsches Haus, uh, Uli Baer, who will moderate the event. And please, just as a reminder to our panelists and also to you, the audience, please speak into the mic. As we're taping this, this will only be caught for the next five years that the Earth will still exist if you speak into the mic. So, <laughs> thank you. Please welcome our panelists. Um, thank you, Juliana. So I'd like to second Juliana. Thanks to JR Day and Deutsches Haus and the staff. Thank you for inviting me to moderate this panel. I don't think I'll be needed very much, but I want to thank first of all Masha and Siri for coming. Thank you so much. Um, both of your when you publish books, they are events. Um, I love what I loved. I've loved it for a long time, um, and I loved your book of essays recently. Um, and Masha, I have your book right here, The Future's History. And I grew up in West Berlin, where the Soviet Union was a very menacing and strange entity. And I'm not drawn to read about it, in a way. And this is post-Soviet Union Russia. It is an incredible book. And I really want to congratulate you. It's so deeply engaging and moving. And to capture a society going through a transformation that was so hopeful, and yet somehow slowly closes in in a kind of from one level of lack of information about itself to another level of misinformation. So maybe we'll start there. Um, and I want to thank the audience. Um, the other option tonight was to go to see Thomas Adesha's The Exterminating Angel at the Metropolitan Opera, which I saw last week. Thomas Adesha is a friend of NYU. It's his opera. It's the Buñuel film where a bourgeois dinner party is trapped and can't leave for quite a long time, this won't happen tonight. But it's a bit this kind of stranger feeling of being trapped in a situation that you can't escape from. And part of what we're trying to do tonight is to see what happens when language is being abused or used in ways that don't quite seem to jive with how we would assume it should work. So maybe, Siri, I'll start with you. Sort of, You wrote in, in the introduction to your last book how the context in which we acquire knowledge changes continually. When you read new things, you learn new things, it changes. Can you, if we think about the context today, there's always been a suspicion of language. Language has always been used and abused. There's always been lying, there's been falsehood, and there's been deception in language. Is there something that you think that makes it a bit more urgent or different? If we, if we can start right there. Yes. I mean, there's, there's no question that I'm as shocked and discombobulated as many of my peers. In other words, I do have a sense that something has happened uh, in the, the culture that is not necessarily new in, in the annals of human history, but there's been a turn. And uh, this is a little, uh, do you, does everyone here remember the Pizzagate mm -hmm. thing? Well, after this happened, this person who ran into the pizza parlor in Washington, D.C. with the gun, I, I started to do a little research on what I was mentioning earlier when we were talking, that I have a sense that there's an epistemological crisis. You know, how do we know what we know, and how does that man get into the pizza parlor? 
right? What is it about belief systems that makes it possible? Now, he was, I, I also looked up him, he was not well, he had run over someone not long before, he was clearly in a, 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 a unsteady state. But he did believe what he read, and when you go into it, you see that one of the clues about this ring was an icon that resembled an icon apparently that pederasts use to communicate. Now, whether this is actually a sign or not, I, I, I don't know, but that was how this engine got going. So what I, and then I went on to, and it's, these things are closely connected to um, some of the evangelical propaganda and once you move through these different epistemologies, if we, you will, you begin to see that uh, the earth is moving beneath your feet, right? So many people here have an idea. We have a kind of consensual notion of what knowledge is, what we believe, what a fact is. We have a tendency to accept recent scientific knowledge, for example, to admire um, I don't know, a well-written scholarly essay about this or that. But what has happened is that the ground is, has always been multiple, but now it's shifted so you really have completely separate, uh, uh, yeah, epistemological methods, if you will, existing at the same time. And it's not within an intellectual framework. It's <laughs> out there. You know, I'm actually going to argue with you a little oh, bit. Oh, please. About, um, I'm about so happy game. when people argue with me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I agree with your conclusion, but I think that uh, the story of Pizzagate is actually much more depressing than that. Okay. Uh, because um, it's not it's not pure craziness. It's not the icon, right? It's not uh, so the, 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 that pizza parlor belongs to uh, a yes. man, um, I, and I forget his name now. But he was for ten years the partner of David Brock. Yeah. David Brock is the author of um, Blinded by the Right. So he was a, uh, a, a Republican activist and fundraiser who then saw the light and became a Democratic fundraiser and wrote this book. Demo uh, blinded by the uh, by the right and he's a major uh, fundraiser for the Democratic Party and a major organizer and so the connection right was clear yes and yes. you know um, and and the reason I say that it's more depressing is because um, you know the David Brock is real his partner is real the the assumption that all gay men are pedophiles is <laughs> real right. uh, and um, and then it's just you know it's just half a step to thinking that Hillary Clinton is running a child sex ring out of the basement of the uh, of that pizza parlor uh, but that kind of conspiracy thinking is is becoming endemic it's right. not you know right. it's not it's not, it's not just the, the 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 pizza parlor and I wish I wish it were just the icon right like no I I, 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 actually, I, I think wish there were, there were yeah. fewer dots to connect but there are enough dots to connect for for somebody who has a particular view of reality that it seems almost inevitable that they got connected Right. Yes, no, I, I, I think that's it. And actually when you're following these sites, what happens is that it reveals a kind of logic. In other words, there's a kind of underlying logic, which is uh, very similar, by the way, to what happens in, in, in schizophrenia. That you're, you know, you, you step out of your house and you see a car and you read the license plate and it is bringing you meanings. You're interpreting the numbers and the letters. And, you know, to be uh, uh, devil's advocate, to some degree, all interpretation, all interpretation, all language, if you will, if we're talking about language, is a form of what they call in neurology confabulation, right? Confabulation is when you have a brain injury and something happens to you and you actually don't have, um, at that moment, the cognitive abilities to, to respond normally. So you make up a big story. 
Yes. Let yeah. me just jump <laughs> in terms of if you're talking about, so <clears throat> let's say there's one story out there and then someone believes that and then we're sitting here and we sort of think, really, Hillary Clinton ran this ring and that doesn't seem likely. Um, could you talk a little bit, who, what are the authorities or the referential functions in these kind of different language games? So they have different operative, you know, they operate in different things and maybe I don't read the same websites you do or sort of what is, where's the authority? And I'm quite interested in, Will there's authority in institutions, real authority, in you know offices and people who are elected officials, et cetera, or have certain kinds of power, and then there's public opinion. And I wonder if something has shifted with the, the shifting landscape of the media and public opinion, that the public opinion is a very powerful thing. It's actually quite interesting that public opinion may be as powerful or more powerful than even the state in a way in controlling what people think or influencing that. But if you could talk about what would be the authorities, you both write scientific articles or about science. So there's a kind of belief in fact-finding, evidence-based, prove verifiability. So how do you verify such a story? We can move away from this particular story, but how do you, what do you actually refer to? What do you go to? You go to the correct website and then you know the truth or you read Marsha Gessen, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. That's always a good, good first but impulse. But for a journalist, this is for some. You work in this. I think you should really answer that. So, um, I mean, I, I, it's actually very close to what I'm. Uh, I've, I've been thinking through, like, for the last few days, specifically, which is that uh, there's uh, we're witnessing yet another period of a death of expertise, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and there's, uh, you know, we're seeing it in government, and it's very intentional. Uh, you know, Donald Trump appointed people to run each agency um, who were, you know, the, opposed to the function, uh, to, yeah. to, to, the, to the mission of that agency, but also who were explicitly incompetent, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he could have, um, uh, a point, and now I'm blanking on the on the name of the neurosurgeon who's uh, running HUD. Yes. Uh, ben, ben Carson. Carson. Thank you. So he could have appointed Ben Carson, you know, uh, to run Health and Human Services, right? And he probably would have been just as destructive. But to appoint him to run HUD is, I mean, it's not it's not only clear a sort of racist assumption, but it's also um, yet another gesture of. Uh, of, of sort of killing expertise, right? And uh, and you know one of my favorite stories, of course, about the the Trump administration is the the story of the inaugural cake that was uh, the exact copy of the of Obama's <laughs> inaugural cake, but was also made of styrofoam, right? Uh, and no one could eat it. So no one. So it's like the perfect the the, uh, the perfect metaphor for the Trump administration, which is that it's a copy of the real thing, and it is not suitable for performing the function that it's supposed to perform, right? And um, uh, and only three three inches of it was, was was sheet cake, and I think that was an accident, right? And uh, and uh, the Obama cake was cake all the way through. But uh, I um, but I think we're also witnessing death of expertise uh, on uh, on the opposite side, right? And I've um, the reason that I've actually been thinking about it because like the, what I just said about the Trump administration is is, is obvious, right? But um, but I've uh, you know I, I rail against the, uh, the the Russia conspiracy theorizing and. Um, I've been in correspondence for the last couple of weeks with a prominent public intellectual who keeps telling me that I'm wrong about Russia. And it kind of boggles my mind because like I will tell him something, you know, just point to sort of certain facts and he'll and he'll say but no, that's not what you're saying. I'm like uh, I can read the text and you can't. You know, um, <laughs> I, uh, not I, a Russian speaker. No, not no, a Russian okay. speaker. No, 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 no. I have studied this stuff, and you, you haven't. And really, like, I can't argue with you about this stuff. Like, you can't argue facts. But this is not. This is not. Uh, you know, some sort of outlier. This is. This is really like so a prominent academic. Could you say a little academic. bit? Where was expertise located? So it, yes, see, that's so a good it's kind question. of interesting. Like, I think you're right, and I think it's a. Uh, so, because it's not expert, uh, but, but where do you think the experts would have? You could would, you would have been an expert, and someone is saying you're not really an expert anymore, right? Because uh, there's opinion out there, or well, and because and because we, you know, we've 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 discredited the academy because it's uh, it's 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 coddled and cloistered and uh, uh, and you know, uh, and and blind to the world. Um, I think that we in the media have actually, in sort of in in, in beating ourselves in the chess post election, have done further damage to trust in the media right um, and I, and I think it's it's actually it hasn't been uh, fact based right uh, there's um, sort of the the, uh, the the this very common trope that uh, 
that we have two bubbles, uh, the left wing bubble and right, the right, right wing right. bubble. That is not true, right? There's a right wing bubble, and if you look at, and there's, a, there's plenty of data on this, um, if you look at media consumption uh, by a majority of people in this country, it's varied, right? A majority of people in this country are routinely exposed to opinions that they don't share, right? That is the opposite of being in a bubble. Right. right and then right. a minority of people in this country consume Breitbart and Fox and nothing else. Right. And are never exposed to opinions that they don't share. Right. And there's a difference, right? And th and that's a right. classic ex example of a false equivalency. But it's undermining the authority of people who are sort of you know nobly ex exercising uh, self-criticism. Well, yeah, I think there you know this is extremely interesting. You know how it's presented, right? It's presented as two isolated uh, camps that are at war, if you will. And actually the right is continually propagating this idea. And I think you're, you're absolutely right, it's wrong. Because um, people in the middle, I guess, and on the left have a tendency to read around, to read more around. But then you have to ask yourself, so what, uh, first of all, anti-intellectualism is something hardly new to the United States. We have the oldest, well, we have a big strain, and you can compare it to Europeans very easily. Um, the respect for intellectuals here has been in the toilet since, you know, yes, we did have some intellectuals there at the start, and we've had some very good ones along the way, but the general populist attitude towards intellectuals is very low. I guess I'm not really talking about that. I'm talking about the, uh, well, sort of the, the, the an, epi an epidemic of academics uh, writing about you know how um, uh, 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 how coddled their students are, how um, I, you know uh, how. But there's both sides of that. I mean, I've read also lots of uh, lots of defenses of 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 the thing. I think that's a much more mixed. I think the conservative media really pushes those. Uh, politically correct uh, uh, articles. I think the academy is much more mingled. But then there's the question of what really drives ideas, right? I mean, what is it? I mean, why are some people attracted to certain ideas and not to others? Now, you can have lots of facts. We could have many, many facts. Uh, we know that because I, I spend a lot of time doing what I call reading against myself. Now, it's not usually reading the Pizzagate stuff. I mean, I have a tendency, like, I, 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 there was a moment when I understood I really had to get into symbolic logic to understand how analytical philosophers were thinking about certain problems. And if I didn't learn it, I was going to be sunk. Now, m I have no natural inclination towards symbolic logic. I happen to be now happy I'm on the other side of it, but that, the point is I am not natural, I don't gravitate toward this. So what is that? It's, it's that emotions are always involved in ideas. And your friend or ex-friend or your interlocutor, <laughs> your, your interlocutor is someone and I think many of us understand this, that, that there's a deep-seated sense of what, you know, the right wing calls values that outweighs what you're telling him mm -hmm. is the truth. Right. I mean, can we talk about that for a moment? So yeah. let's say political discourse has, a, has always had lies in it, but now we have actually the highest office in the land, and he's actually saying things that are not true, and then he doesn't really seem to care, and he says something else afterwards, and then other people care a lot, and they expose it, but that, what Siri said, people are attracted to certain things because he does several things. He has gone against what he thinks is political correctness. He says these things that are not supposed to be sayable in this country, and, there was a, and I think the university has actually contributed quite a bit to this sense. I think there are people you've cited who've who sit in the university and cry about the university because they're coddling. It's, it's all a little confusing to me because I don't see it, and I've been in the university for 21 years. But they see maybe something else. But there's something that's been opened up with a kind of critique of authority. Let's say, generally speaking, which was also 
salutary and it was good and it was important to not just say there's a bunch of basically five men who tell you what the world is about. Walter Cronkite, I'm sure he's a great person. But there was a kind of opening up of authority. And in some ways what seems that this political establishment is exploiting that to an extreme position and saying, well, there's no authority. It's my authority which is based on affect, emotion and values, not on fact. But I wonder how much had been opened up and whether this kind of culture of expertise, of authority, in people who'd done the work, who'd done the research, who speak the languages, you know, real and you know, metaphoric languages, they'd been discredited in a way, and maybe that was also good <laughs> up to a point. America, I think, also has a very good attitude toward authority. Sometimes it's skeptical. It's not completely beholden to authority, right? So that's a positive, one would think. So how do you get to a place where you don't throw out all authority and open it to affect, emotion, and kind of, you know, demagoguery. Well, you know, I mean, I, I think that Trump, he actually does a couple of different things. And, um, and I'm not sure that what you're describing is the most important thing that he does, because I think the most important thing that he does is he lies, um, he, uh, he lies w uh, without actually trying to change your perception of reality. Mm -hmm. He lies purely to assert power. So he, um, you know, he will say that he had the biggest inauguration in, in, in history um, when it's demonstrably not true and then, um, and then in, you know, insist on saying it or, or in saying that a million and a half illegal immigrants uh, voted illegally or whatever it was he said or um, and it makes uh, or, or that he was wiretapped by, by Obama uh, knowing that it can be disproven and I think that that's part of what gives the statement power. Mm. You know, every time he does this, he says, I have the biggest microphone in the world. Mm -hmm. right. And I assert my right to say whatever the hell I want. And the fact that I can say whatever the hell I want and, re and continue saying it is actually proof of my power. Mm -hmm. right. uh, but and, then, yeah. and, that, and that's a kind of authority in itself. But also, I, I mean, I really do think that there's a kind, there's a rhetorical power to Trump's technique, and it's an old one. If you listen to him, you'll see that he repeats everything three times. It's almost always three times. And the slogans are not only in the heads of his followers, they're in all our heads, right? Make America great again. Lock her up. Build a wall. Now, I kept thinking about this, build a wall, build a wall, build a wall. Now, those people who voted for Trump did not really believe he was going to build a wall. I mean, I, I, I don't think that these people are uniformly stupid people who think he's going to build a wall. What is the rhetorical power of this? Right? The rhetorical power goes into very old uh, tribal ideas about purification and walls and the body and invaders that his audience is alarmed about. This is about purity, about you know, fear of the pollution of the other. You know, the barbarians are at the gate. And it gives us a big rush to hear, build a wall. I don't think Trump voters are so upset that he's not going to build the wall. And that is, I think these appeals we have to understand, and that the rage of those rallies, the rage that, you know, when you watched them, you saw in the faces of the people. What, what is that rage about? I think that rage is the quickest route out of shame. A feeling of those hoity-toity, fancy-schmancy people. I, I mean, I grew up in Minnesota, so I'm not talking out of my head. Uh, you know, I, I grew up with people who felt that kind of shame that you think you're better than I am. Build a wall, lock her up. The misogyny, the xenophobia, it, you know, the racism, it was inspiring. And if you go around, you hear Trump voters always said this thing. He tells it like it is. He's, 
He's an honest guy. He's, and I, I heard this too, which is completely untrue. He's a self-made man. I mean, if we stay with these two, so there's a kind of rhetorical force, and then you're saying, um, Marsha, there's authority itself in just saying it and knowing you can sort of say it. Not even get away, you'd not get away, just say it. And he'd started out by discrediting President Obama for a long time, yeah. which may or may not have registered everywhere. Um, and that was just out there in a way. And in some ways, I'm curious from your position, sort of having analyzed other major political figures, what is the long-term effect of that? Someone just saying things for the sake of sort of cementing his authority to be able to say it. Um, well, I think that uh, what I experienced in Russia as a writer was that it, it does irreparable damage to the language, right? And I've heard the same thing from, from my friends who are now trying to recover language uh, in post Berlusconi Italy. Right, uh, 20 years of using words to mean their opposite or using words to mean nothing, or just, just, just using words to throw at people to create cacophony or to, or to lie. Uh, and Berlusconi actually lies in very much the same way, in the, you know, in the, in the way yes, of asserting did. power, yeah. right? Uh, uh, and Putin does the same thing. Uh, so it's very hard to, to use language. Uh, and I had that experience when I, when I first went back to Russia to work as a journalist in the early 90s. It was very difficult to use Russian post-Soviet, right? Because, because so much of the language had been made unusable. Uh, the, the, sort of anything that had to do with politics was made unusable, simply because words were, were used to mean their opposite, right? But, um, but what was worse is that anything that had to do with passion, anything that had to do with ideals was made unusable. So we, ha we had to like stay in a very narrow space of using only nouns and verbs and, <laughs> and just saying what happened. Uh, and, um, um, and because I, uh, I, I was in a somewhat unique position because I could, uh, I was writing simultaneously in, in Russian and English and I could see just how much more freedom I had in English. Um, and then, then under Putin who, uh, not only uses words to mean their opposite, but just uses language uh, to create cacophony, um, it's just become very, very difficult to use words at all, to communicate using language. Uh, and I think that that's, uh, we have to be so intentional now about using language because this is happening right now, right here. Uh, you know, language is, 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 is being ripped out from under us. It's true, but it's funny about the media because language is a, a form of a contagion. We all pick up words, right? So you notice these things like baked in. <laughs> I think it might be almost gone now because people aren't saying baked in. But for a while, everything was baked in. It's baked in. And I remember thinking, what's baked in? You know, I, and there are many of these words that, that travel uh, and become the way one speaks about a particular issue. And, and that's fascinating. It's just, I think, the nature of things where we, we catch it. You know, we catch these words. Can you say something else when you said the language of passion mm -hmm. or values was devalued? What had happened? Had they used these words too much? Or can they, because how, how does that actually happen that words lose their meaning? We think, you know, we, we know what they mean. People learn language. So what, what was the actual process before it got to when you couldn't use them anymore? So I think that uh, language was, uh, I mean, when, when, I, when I talk about language of passion and values, I'm particularly uh, talking about mobilization, right? So totalitarian society is a mobilized society. And mobilization requires excessive emotion. Mm -hmm. uh, and so words that have to do with passion, not only are words themselves suspect, but the impulse behind using the words is suspect. Oh, you want to, to elicit uh, excessive emotion in me, been there. Mm. Uh, I no longer trust you. Right, right. So in, at this moment in our culture, it's, it's almost odd to discuss, to say, to be very intentional about language because, and I, I do note that I work in a university and in higher education, I don't really believe that language departments are the center of people's discussion or interest and English departments aren't, and uh, the humanities at large are not really, and 
That's actually interesting when you think it's so important. We're living in a moment in world history where it's so incredibly important what a man says. But the culture at large seems to have drifted. I mean, you know, y y you have children like I'm trying to even, you're trying to teach them how to spell. And they can look at you and say, why spell? I have the other Siri on oh, my phone, you know, like, and so, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. so, but I think it's actually, in, like, that language actually matters so greatly, and you brought Klemperer, who, you know, diagnosed yeah. what happened to language in the Third Reich and, and the Nazis, what happened to the devaluation of language and how language, how do you arrest that back? It happens in a lot of countries, but it's actually an odd thing to think about, to focus on language when people think politics are about power and policies and institutions. And can you sort of locate in this, in this post-Soviet moment, was it able to get this language back, or has Putin kind of undone that effort as well? Um, there was a lot of interesting stuff going on uh, in journalism in the 90s. I think Putin has undone it, but, um, but pretty much every publication that I know of had its long lists of words and phrases that could not be used. Uh, and um, <clears throat> and I think that actually, uh, I mean, the, the publications in this country have, have them too. Like uh, the New York Review of Books will not let you use the word narrative to mean anything but the narrative in a book, right? Uh, and the New York Times won't let you use the word trope, with I think very good reason. But um, uh, so I, th I think it's great to uh, it's part of uh, the job of an editor to to notice when a word is being abused um, and. You know, note that 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 it should be set aside. So, I think that actually the very fact of the existence of such lists is uh, uh, is a sign to to writers to be intentional about language, right? So it's not the list becomes less important than the than the message that it sends. But um, but I remember those lists were really long in a lot of publications because people were doing the work of sort of figuring out what was going wrong with their writing. And ed editors were you know, noticing f phrases or, uh, or or even turns of phrase that um, uh, th that that sounded Soviet, and that had to be retired at least for a while. Well, I I think it's it's fascinating because we all are vulnerable, and the idea that you know it's a very Bakhtinian idea, right? That there are uh, what we live in a. a, a you know, it's my belief about language that, you know, every word is half someone else's. And uh, that it's not some kind of static code that we can pluck up. It's, and it's always shot through with power relations, which is, you know, hence the care. Uh, but I also find that <laughs> there are times when one can, in a way, write oneself out of uh, uh, of what you'd call collective discourse. You know, I mean, uh, one of the points that was sent to us earlier was the idea that in the Soviet Union, and you write about in your book, that discourse was completely occluded because disciplines were not allowed to grow. They weren't allowed to read books that were written. They weren't up to date, so to speak. And so they were shut down. Now the interesting thing about uh, we that is not true here, right? We, we are not sh shut down, well, but we're totally specialized. Well, let me ask you <laughs> this. So I heard this on Tuesday. Yeah. So the assumption among working scientists is to get a federal grant, you ought to not use the word climate change. You just avoid no, it. Yeah. Just avoid it. You're not in Florida where you're not allowed to use it if you're a state employee. But as a, as a scientist, you want to get a federal grant. The people who are going to be start reviewing your grants are going to be people who don't believe that exists. So you can find a grant, but this is unlikely to get funded. So as a scientist, do you make the decision to say, I'm going to be kind of a, you know, renegade poet and rest this language back? And, you know, I'm very invested in this. I grew up in Germany and the person who I worked on is Paul Ceylon, who felt German was so compromised that you actually couldn't use it anymore, and you had to he turn rein it. He reinvented it. it. Reinvented, but it didn't quite work. And there's a certain no. kind of ballast in the language. There's some terms that I feel are unusable probably for hundreds of years. But so as a scientist, do you make this decision to say, I'm going to defy this and write my grant proposal to study the impact of or whatever climate change? Or am I going to just sort of, you know, just adapt a bit, accommodate a bit, not use that word, 
have the list that is kind of unspoken, and that is the seeping kind of what Klemperer says. There's an accommodation. People That's start right. backing out of that. You have people saying, well, let's not use climate change because it'll just piss people off or you won't get funded. Those are two separate things. If you won't get funded, That's there's right. real power. People are in charge right now who can determine people's Absolutely. Yeah. So this is, I think, the seeping sense and how do you start doing that if you start looking like you're not going to, you know, you're not going to... And, and this is very closely related to totalitarian regimes to the experience uh, experiences in the Soviet Union and of course in Germany uh, you know a little bit and you know I, I, I see this all the time you know how bad is this how bad is Trump how authoritarian is it how s frightened should be we be and when people are in the middle of what will become a historical situation those are profound moral questions. I mean, the question you just said, those are profound moral questions. Is it better to go along and get some money to do your research, or do you draw a hard line uh, for ethical reasons? Or is there another alternative? And the other example, alternative would be? I'm not sure, but what if all the major senior scientists in this country at major institutions actually bring this out over and over again to say there was this a cannot march. be a creeping <laughs> kind of progression. Yeah. yeah. That I'm not totally sure, but actually I think it's interesting that because you're both science writers and I'm not, but it's sort of that science would have to be concerned about the use of language. Where it's mostly a tool oh, to present ideas. It's actually, not as, actually as much as it they is. are. So every grant, I mean, so many scientists right. I know tell me that in order, so let's say you're doing genetics research and you don't really know what can come of this research, you're really curious about it, but in your grant you write that it might, not might, you say, this could have a profound effect on cancer research. Now. You don't really know. Scientists do that as a matter of course, by the way. So I, I think we should be a little, so now we're talking about cooperating with a government that, you know, you know, where do you say? So this is a, it becomes politicized, but it's always politicized. It's, 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 it's funny that we found our way back to purity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, whatever that is. And I, again, I'm not answering it, you understand. I'm simply uh, making an observation about the gradations. But I'm, I'm also concerned about things that that we can talk about because because we can talk about them not because like you can't get a federal grant, mm -hmm. but because they are in some way unspeakable, right? Like the fact that we've been living with the threat of nuclear war with North Korea for three months, right? Yeah, I can't talk about it because how, how do you, right? And so we don't. Uh, and I was um, I was listening to a podcast uh, the other day and I thought. We haven't actually talked about corruption. In no, months, no, right? No, it's just you know the fact that Trump hasn't separated himself from his businesses, and the fact that Ivanka and Jared are in all the meetings, and like all that, that thing, because yeah. there's nothing to, you know, th that conversation is just not. It's impossible in some way or another. I'm not even. Uh, I, I, I but don't. But why is it impossible? Why. Is it because there's so much going on that people can't bring it up? I, I agree, but why? I, I guess it's partly, yeah, there's so much going on. Uh, I think there's not if, uh, an apparent solution. It was very clear from the beginning that he wasn't going to uh, separate himself from his businesses. And this was the sort of thing that unless he uh, divest, divested radically, it was unsolvable. And because it's unsolvable, much like uh, you know, less consequentially, but much like the threat of nuclear war with North Korea, it's also, it also becomes unspeakable. But I think, Marsha, there's a kind of um, entertainment value to Trump, and I actually think, you know, make you blush, but I actually think you have a capacity to step out and say, okay, this is what's going on, this is what's going on, 
And this is what's at stake. So you're saying to Ivanka and Jared, and believe me, if Chelsea and Mark were in meetings, we would be, you know, everybody would be having a fit. You know, like <laughs> Chelsea went to Tokyo. Can you imagine? She wasn't appointed. She doesn't have a real cabinet position. I mean, right. people would, right. you know, we would have an impeachment trial right now. Seriously. Absolutely. There's a kind Absolutely. of level. So I think there's an entertainment value, which people actually experience as panic attacks or distractions in a certain way. And rather than saying, okay, let's step away. So this is untoward. And why is that? And sort of to say it's unsolvable because it's unsolvable because Congress will not act or because no one's going to investigate, no one's going to put pressure on it. So what you're saying, people back away from things as unsayable, but they're saying a lot. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of, I mean, you cannot actually, I mean, I was saying walking over here, it's like, it's so cold, you know, let's blame Trump. It's unbelievable, you know. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a kind of exhaustive coverage that Trump is responsible for everything. And this kind of domination of our collective imagination, I think that's another F effect. It's does n not even if you can recite all the words, which we all can, but, but this, and, yeah. it, and I'm sort of trying to question sort of, can the media pull itself out? And you do this very skillfully. I think you sort of say like, this is what's going on. You give us a bit of the kind of titillating, exciting thing. And then you say, this <laughs> is what's at stake. But right. to shift back and forth is really But I think it's quite rare, I mean, to be honest. I think it's, I, I know that, I mean, listen, I read good things almost every day, but there's a lot, of, you know, there are moments when I think the problem with the news is that it's the news, right. right? So you need to keep going. That's the nature of the news, is that something new <laughs> happens and everyone covers it. And to put it into some kind of larger conceptual frame is much more rare. Well, I, I mean, I think that you're right. And I think in a way, journalism is just unsuited for the task at hand. Um, journalism doesn't work in historical time. Right. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. that's, that's for academics. Uh, and in fact, it's kind of a need division of labor that you know journalists work in immediate time, uh, and when an academic says that 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 they're working on uh, uh, on contemporary history, they mean you know the last sixty years. And for <laughs> journalists, that's ancient history. <laughs> and, uh, last week is yeah. <laughs> exactly. um, so I think you know we we may just not not have the tools at our disposal to to, to do this. Um, and, but I also think, I, I, I came across this just a few days ago, this wonderful uh, a Russian writer writing actually about something completely different, uh, about 18th century Russians, but he used this wonderful term. He called it provincial time. And, he, uh, and, uh, and, I, and I was like, oh my God, yes, we're living in provincial time right now. It's like we're, we're concerned with right now, and, but there's a kind of fog because, uh, you know, the sort of a... Um, a part of being provincial is not quite feeling your outlines in the world. Absolutely. And I, and I very much feel that. I feel like, like w sort of we've descended into that, um, that mushy state of not, of, of not feeling outlines, uh, our outlines in time and, 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 and space. Well, and partly because there is a lot, I think, that people are feeling that this is, you know, the, the rhetorical environment that we're living in now does not feel like anything in my lifetime. I mean, we could not have imagined a president saying the things that, that this man has said, right? I mean, this is new talk. It is a new kind of talk. And that has ushered in another feeling of, of a kind of radical shift. Now, whether that's actually true or not, I'm not even speculating on. I am simply saying that the, the sort of abandonment of what was a form of decorum, even when uh, Republicans were, as they say, this is a word from the press, dog whistling, right? Um, uh, racism, xenophobia, all of that was there. It certainly didn't start with Trump. But now the naked rhetoric, the rec rhetoric that makes his base say he tells it like it is. This is a fascinating change in the landscape, uh, the verbal landscape, if you will, of uh, American politics. And, and I, I, I'm eager to hear what people 
think of that. I mean, you can say that he's saying what has been said in America for a long time. It's not new in a way that we haven't heard it. It's just he happens to occupy the White House. So you hear it from a different place. You heard it from him for years. There was never any ambiguity. No, you never. Many times he said, you figure out what a you know, demagogue or somebody wants, you listen. You keep on saying this, you listen carefully. He's told you just about everything. He has no mistakes. No. And the other part is this kind of, I'm kind of interested, are there unsayable things, taboo things in American society? You know, yes and no. And he's sort of, when people get all worked up, he says things about race that hadn't been said before. They, they have been said. Yes. Also, otherwise, yes. it wouldn't resonate with millions of right. people. Right, of course. So there's of a course. weird part of like, unbelievable when Kelly, what's his first name, the chief of staff, um, he got the Civil War a little wrong, it seems. You know, and, <laughs> and his, historians actually... Pretty were, wrong. Uh, Ron Chernoff, <laughs> who is the biographer of Hamilton, and you now Grant was here last week, and he said, let me take two minutes to actually explain what kind of narrative, to use that word, the time yeah. that you use, yeah. the New York Review books, what that is, what he's saying, why people say that, that many, many people say that, and what's wrong with it. And as a historian, right. I can do that. It took him right. two minutes. It didn't right. take him a book, not the biography of Grant. Five no, no, pages. no. So there is a way to undo this in a way, but I think people don't even have the patience. And I wonder whether, I don't know, whether journalists have to step back sometimes and say, let me take a paragraph to actually explain what the Civil War is. It doesn't do rush to the new news story. So you're saying academics have to do all this back work, but... It seems a little bit risky to just be so taken with the moment that yeah, well, you're I think buried they, by they it. missed a bit of Trump also by saying he had a history. Mm -hmm. And then no, we recover. So I'm just saying it's new, but not so new for many people. Right. So this no, no, is no, what, it's, so this, it's so not. I, I agree. I, 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 I'm really way. talking about l the, the language of, of, of Trumpism, if you will. Yeah. That is actually unprecedented, not that it doesn't exist in the culture, not that people haven't been talking like this. I mean, I, I think this was part of the appeal, right? But uh, usually the misogyny, the uh, racism, the xenophobia, they were covered over by, by a veneer of politesse, if you will, whatever, so that people could understand what they were saying, but it would be said in a presidential way. Remember when there were the, all these journalists saying, just wait, when he gets into office, he's going to become presidential. And I thought, are they mad? What, who are these people? They think that this person who has, as you say, told us everything. There were no secrets about Trump. He was, he's not a secret hidden being. He's a malignant narcissist, and we knew, and everyone must have known. It's, it's a problem the, of the imagination. If you, I mean, it, it was like, I, and then one of the most instructive conversations I had with people was one, uh, in the spring of 2016. I was talking to a friend, uh, and I said, so, you know, he's locked up the nomination. My friend said, no, no, no. The Republicans are going to do something. Uh, he's oh, not going to be that. To get him out, yeah. yeah. And I said, well, wh what makes you think that? Uh, thinking that he was going to like tell me what was actually going to happen in the Republican convention. And he said, well, I just can't imagine him becoming the nominee. And I thought, oh, that's the key to everything. It's like when the imagination fails us, fails you, yeah. we just say, oh, that's not going to happen. I mean, that's what four-year-olds do. And, uh, and that's kind of uh, how much I think we have been infantilized by the situation with uh, the toddler or the teenager in the White House, um, where, oh, I can't imagine this being in the White House. So that's not going to happen. And so then everybody agrees he's going to become presidential. Um, right. But, but I think provincialism, the word that you used <laughs> before, is uh, uh, advantageous. Because uh, if one looks at historical precedents, if one looks at the history of rhetoric, of persuasion, <laughs> of all of this, it's all there. Uh, and and it, not that it's identical. Historical situations are never identical, but there's certainly precedents for uh, this kind of uh, uh, rhetorical atmosphere. Yeah, but um, 
We actually, because the problem is mostly we learn, or most people learn about history from history books. And history books uh, rely on texts a lot of the time, most of the time. And so they actually create a much more coherent narrative, uh, the, the hello to the narrative review books, than, um, uh, uh, than, than exists in lived time, and that can possibly exist in lived time. Of course, of and course. Of, and, 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 um, and they also, uh, uh, they also uh, I think, imbue uh, you know, demagogues with much more coherent ideology than they ever really have, uh, have had or, or, or have now. And so you know, most people are convinced that Hitler had a belief system and a coherent ideology, and all you have to do is read Klemperer to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to remember that that's not the case, or read Eric Fromm, or, or read Hannah Arendt. But if you read history books, they will tell you that he had a coherent ideology and a, and a, and a, and a belief system, uh, and uh, you know, and that humanity didn't sort of stumble into the abyss. Right. Uh, but the idea of stumbling into the abyss is even more scary. Yes. Than than. than I do have a quote. Yeah. Here it is: "The receptivity of the great masses is very limited. Their intelligence is small, but their power of forgetting is enormous." In consequence of these facts, all effective propaganda must be limited to a very few points and must harp on these slogans until the last member of the public understands what you want him to understand by your slogan. Adolf Hitler. So that's from Mein Kampf, and we know that was uh, written before. <laughs> so, in this one point, Hitler does seem to have had an idea. And he does seem to have an idea that was then carried out uh, with uh, a certain rigor uh, uh, during the Third Reich. So, uh, and, 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 and it was effective. And with new technology. And with I mean, new he technology, distributed radios to tens of millions of people, just like Donald Trump figured out that you know Twitter works for him. And, and in some ways, I think it's, it's a works. weird thing, interesting thing. It's not neutral. It works for him, like you said earlier. Just by putting it out, he says, "I can put this out." It doesn't even matter what it says. I don't, you know, God help us all to read the tweets, but they're just there. And some of people talk more about the fact that he tweets a lot than what he actually does or not. And so this kind of authority, that's, there's, a, there's something that has shifted yet again. There was new technology, and now there's new technology yet again. And the public shifts. And I want to go back. So if journalists, they work in real time. It's a bit provincial time, as you said, right? <laughs> it's right here. Academics, they take a long time to write their books. So that'll be a couple of years until they write their tomes on Trump. Um, so what is to be done in terms of you, are we supposed to match the lack of civility with more lack of civility. Because I think we're also kind of, I think journalists and academics are kind of guarded and say, we don't want to go there. We don't want to attack him in this way. We don't just want to tweet for the sake of tweeting. Right. Um, and if you go, if you ever, you've probably been, I'm sure you've been in this role, if you go online, if you say something online that people don't like on the other side, they are very quick and very organized and they say a lot online and liberals say nothing. I mean, very little. In, <laughs> no, if you actually provoke a response, thousands yeah. of people are very organized to attack you, but liberals they just think, well, yeah, I, I don't know. You'd have to look at both sides. Um, so uh, what do you do? How, how do you counter these things? Um, I think there are moments for real hostile rhetoric. And I have given a couple of speeches. <laughs> One that's a long list of people at Cooper Union, which was the self-made man, which was a sort of violent and caustic parody of this American mythology. Um, I wrote a piece for Slate that didn't go viral, but it was like after several hours, there were 300,000 people, probably more than have read my books. And, you know, and that was the same thing, this caustic, uh, ironic, but highly rhetorical piece talking about misogyny during the camp campaign. And the tone, of course, got people's attention. Um, so I think there is a role for um, uh, fury, 
you know, for a kind of righteous rhetorical fury. If I mean, not lying, you know, not, <laughs> not, not saying things you don't believe or making something uh, uh, too simple. Uh, but no, this is not my general voice when I'm writing a, a science paper or, or an essay or a novel, no. But I do think that there's a place for that. And you're right that, you know, one of those speeches I gave about Emma Lazarus, you know, and it was really like addressing Trump, you know, m you know uh, uh, President Trump, blah, blah, blah. And on the steps, people were like, pulling out little nice poems to read. And I thought, this is not the moment. What are you doing here? This is a time for political opposition to stand up and say. And you know, I know I'm not gonna be, I mean, I've read your book, the, the uh, most recent book, and you know, I, I don't feel that someone's gonna arrest me or put me in prison, so. <laughs> You know, it's not that brave. I do, I do want to say something about that, it. but I said much yeah. earlier. The state is one thing. Public opinion, the court of public opinion, is a very powerful force. Simone Weil said the masses or the public cannot yes. think. They don't form a thought. It's not possible for many people. <laughs> one person can think. But she said they're incredibly powerful. And in our, you know, Republican, in our democracy in America, actually... Free speech, I think, is as threatened by the state as it is by public opinion. I, so if yeah, you I say agree. something, and they're not going to arrest you. But if people are very systematic about attacking you online, it is very threatening. Yes. And it's silencing, and it drowns out a lot of things. So I think that's actually another factor where Trump benefits, because it's this kind of echo chamber. and there's It's true, but then there are, there's the, the, the other part that there are people who really like it. You know, there's like the go girl part. So I, 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 <laughs> I think, you know, and, and the people say, oh, well, you know, you're just, what is it called? Singing to the choir? Is that? Preaching to the choir. Preaching to the choir. Um, but but, but that's something to too. The exactly. That, that, that's something too. Uh, that's, I think that's okay. And we shouldn't think that. Um, that there's no need to sharpen our rhetorical tools to speak, to preach, <laughs> to the choir. No, I, I, I agree. Um, I, I don't have a prescription. I actually think that it's impossible to say what's right. It's just possible to try to identify what's wrong, which happens to fortunately coincide with my profession. That's, uh, <laughs> uh, but, um, but you know, there are things, uh, the things I really worry about it, uh, it's messy language. It's uh, it's falling into language traps like the way that we've started, uh, a lot of us have started using the word political in a, uh, as, 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 a, as a demeaning word, as a dismissive word, you know, that's just politics. Like, politics is all we have, and it's exactly. being destroyed. But you know, exactly. don't say it's just politics. No, or, or I let the other word, partisanship. Excuse me? Is there something wrong with partisanship? Why is this suddenly a bad word in the culture? I mean, I find this fascinating. And it's, it's all over the press, this politics or partisanship. Well, of course, if you've thought through what you think, you often become partisan. You take a position. Are there things you're worried about, Marsha? I'd like to hear <laughs> that. I'm really, I'm really <laughs> worried about humor. I'm like, uh, I'm like worried about humor in a really circular way. But I'm, um, I'm worried that uh, that we're laughing at things that we shouldn't laugh at, that really aren't oh, funny. Say, say, uh, say what you think. Yeah, I mean, I, I um, so like for example, you know, what's funny? Uh, so I, th I think the way that political satire usually works is that. Uh, something that is uh, is taken to its logical, absurd extreme, and then it becomes funny. And what's happening now is that we turn on Saturday Night Live, and nothing is taken to any extreme. It's just they're just saying exactly what was yes, said earlier yes. in the news program or you know in the White House briefing, and it wasn't funny. Mm -hmm. And then because it's 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 11:30 at night on a Saturday, it suddenly is funny, but it's not funny. You know, and um, 
and another effect of the of the of the late night shows, and you know, the, the, a lot of these comedians do it absolutely brilliantly, but it's just to to do the thing actually that the uh, journalists are failing uh, at, which is which is put news in a slightly longer context, right? So John Oliver does it brilliantly. You know, he will do these long reports, reminding people what ha what came before, right? Um, you know, Samantha Bee does the same thing. It's like. And this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and that's how we ended up here. And suddenly it's funny, and it's like not funny at all, <laughs> right? Um, and, um, and, and sometimes I, I, I started noticing it in my talks when I, uh, especially when I quote Trump a lot, people laugh. Mm. And I feel like it's a kind of hysterical laughter. And it I is, think it's, I think. It's a yeah. laughter of relief because, um, because someone is saying something that, that they feel. Right, and and so it points to what's not happening in regular journalism. It's not actually corresponding to how people are receiving, uh, perceiving reality. It's not affirming, sort of the lived experience. And then, and then the late night comedy shows are affirming that experience. Right. Uh, they they speak to a shared reality, and it's funny. But uh, but that really worries me. That I think something is getting flipped there. And I can just I can just uh, finish that thought with a quick anecdote because I think it's it's somehow very weirdly uh, illustrative of, of what I'm trying to say. So I was in, I was participating in filming the Samantha B uh, segment, where um, they were interviewing people on the street, uh, man on the street interviews, with pre-screened people, uh, which is okay for a comedy show, but not okay obviously for a news show, <laughs> and that's part of the uh, of, of, of a problem that we're having with sort of uh, blurred uh, boundaries. But these people, these men on the street, were had been referred by a New York City therapist uh, because they were people who were willing to be filmed talking about how they were suffering from stress because of all the alerts in their phones and stuff. And so I was playing myself, but a counselor who talked to these people about how to deal with their alerts and their phones, and how to stay <laughs> outraged, uh, and um, and you know, as me. And the producer said to me, "You're really good at playing yourself. A lot of people aren't, but you're like really good at playing yourself." And I thought, "Well, that's great, you know." And um, and then I went home, and three days later, I get a letter forwarded by the publicity department of my publishers. And it says I was I participated in filming this the, in the filming of the Samantha B segment, and Masha Gessen was my counselor, and I was wondering if I could schedule another session. <laughs> and this was serious. And the, you know this person didn't have a misapprehension of who I am. I mean he found me through my publisher. Uh, but something had gotten very, very blurry in the, um, in this picture, and that 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 too goes to the heart of why I'm really worried about humor because it's not it's not ultimately sort of clarifying reality. Right. But so this is the thing. Actually, before I came, I started thinking about you know rhetoric and and you know in my uh, sort of reading past, I, I I told you I went back to Kenneth Burke, and you know he has the frames, the comic, and, and the tragic frame. And the tragic frame fits very beautifully into the Trump, Trumpist idea, which is that it's all about purification and push and pollution, right? So the pollutant is coming in, and then you have to, to, to push it out. And the comic is a much more tolerant uh, uh, position with subversion, you know, making jokes about the structure uh, of, of what is. And I think that's, I think, if I understand you correctly, that what you're saying is um, that because there's an impossibility of parody, that that nudging that the great comic state <laughs> can do, which, as Burke says, initiates change, is not happening. And that, so, so what you get is a kind of inertia as opposed to, um, you know, jiggling up the situation in, into movement. I mean, the tragic is a difficult and complicated genre because it turns you into a kind of victim of fate. There's a kind of the deep personified fate, and no matter what you do, you're going to go against it. And sort of tragic, I think, is really tricky as a political kind of genre because it removes a certain part of 
agency that citizens should have because tragedies happen to people whether what it doesn't matter what you're going to do you're going to end up in a tragic with a tragic outcome so it's tricky so comedy would be a much more apt one if it would be a kind of outrageous insane burlesque that is more what we're in in a way because but, it keeps yeah. you it keeps you engaged in a way to participate and shape the outcomes i think right well it's hard I, to burlesque I, the I burlesque i do want to ask yeah. masha as a therapist now sort of i need some help <laughs> <laughs> i do have a very specific question and actually i've really been wrestling with this so after charlottesville so when um, heather hare was murdered and two state troopers lost their lives because we had richard spencer you know having this um charade of a political rally at um, university of virginia mm -hmm. And then afterwards, Trump said these things, and he said there's good people on many sides. And then people got incredibly upset. And to be honest with you, I'd been sort of watching the whole free speech debates on campus, and I'd heard the entire summer from all liberals, well, there's people on both sides, and you've got to really listen to them, and you have to listen to the Nazis and the Klan. We really have to understand. And I actually think he was, in a clumsy way, <laughs> saying what every liberal says, well, there's another side to this, you know, I mean, and to be honest with you, ironically, I mean, Richard Spencer is getting <coughs> common, like, recommendations from really distinguished colleagues of mine all the time. I mean, people, they, I mean, people are on record saying, absolutely, he must come to my campus. You know, no climate change deniers, no creationists, no Holocaust deniers, no crank scientists, but Richard Spencer, absolutely. Really? That's an interview online, right? It's really odd because they make an exemption. Why? Because it's political speech, which must never be regulated. They make a big mistake between academic freedom and... But I'm interested in Trump having assumed this position, which I really think he was in a clumsy way saying, well, you got to look at both sides. And there is a kind of unacceptable part. You don't actually look at the other side like the Nazis want to take over America. That's not something we really want to consider. <laughs> but he was happened to be speaking in this free speech moment and he sounded to me, I, and this is so. This is why I'm talking to you as a therapist, like I really was struggling. <laughs> and I wasn't that outraged. I thought, well, I've heard this all summer. That's <laughs> really interesting. Uh, I mean, he has a real instinct for, for sort of assimilating liberal speech. Right, uh, and he usually throws it out even more clumsily. But I was really struck when he uh, remember when he said that the theater should be the safe space. <laughs> That's that, that, like where did he even get that phrase, right? Uh, but, uh, Fox News. Oh, I guess it it might have been Fox News, but um, uh, but 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 he you know, and then he 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 uses those phrases to mean you know really their opposite. I remember the theater it was it was it was it was, it was great because he was. Um, he was talking about how, uh, it was when when Mike Pence went to to see Hamilton and and um, and then the the troop addressed him and then um, the, the and and uh, the cast addressed him and then and then, and then uh, Trump said well that that sh you know they shouldn't have done that the theater should be a safe space it was like the opposite on every count right it was a public place an elected official. <laughs> Being addressed respectfully uh, yeah. by the cast, right, and 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 that made it not a safe space. So I think y you're you're right to pick up on that. I mean, he he uh, he uses those phrases from the liberal discourse. It makes me feel a lot better. Good, I'm <laughs> glad. I'm glad. No, Just not in a kind of jokey way. I actually think it was troubling because I do think what has surprised me that I'm not making this up. Richard Spencer gets not a pass but a strong endorsement to be able to give a speech while we're distancing ourselves from the speech. So, these, so for me, this was interesting, and I thought when he picks up on that, a lot of people resonate and say, well, you've got to look at, let's, let's re-examine some of these things, whether maybe that was a good idea. So I think this is what he opens up to for people also in this kind of weird attack on political correctness, which, to go back to where we started, happens to be very pervasive in the university itself, where people are very upset about political correctness in the university so he picks up on these on these kinds of tropes to use another word the new york times won't let us use right <laughs> and deploys them against themselves mm -hmm. that's that's actually what happens to language also they're not meaningless they're just used against what you think they should be used for right it's like you know they become weaponized or something and that has happened from the 80s family the flag america Everything. it doesn't mean people like me you know, it means something else. And why did the left stand by and let that happen? Like, why did the left allow these symbols and terms to be appropriated? Well, I, right? I mean, I think, I think racism is something that is, you know, <laughs> worth bringing into these ideas. There's a, a Dutch um, man, his last name is, I think it's M-U-D-D-E, 
uh, and his first name is Moss. I don't know how to pronounce it. Yes? Uh, okay, and he talks about the fact that every time there's a right-wing populist victory, um, there is a rush by the press. It happened with Brexit, it happened with Trump, to talk about how the elites have forgotten the real people out there on the plains, you know, in, in, in our case, and, and, and these poor people, they've been deprived, and they're suffering, and, and, and what are we doing? And as this guy, he actually, um, I read some of his papers, and then he had a piece in The Guardian, and he said, the important thing to understand is that angry white men are not the people. Now, this is, okay, this is a broad point, but I think it's, so, I think there's really, it's, this speaks to something. I was at the Women's March, nobody called us the people, right? Women are not the people. Black Lives Matter, they're not the people. And this is partly the fact that most, many still journalists are white guys, and they get all gushy and sympathetic. And, and, and we have to remember that, you know, there's a white <laughs> prejudice here, and those, and white people elected Trump, not the rest of, you know, us. I'm very white, I know, but, uh, but not, you know, that's not who, who did it. And, and I don't think we can talk about this without really examining that. A certain bias that exists for suffering white guys that is spread out all over the place. And a lot of it is implicit. It's part of perceptual values that are <laughs> baked in. <laughs> I used it. OK. I'm going to. Uh, if there's anything else uh, you want to share, and then I'm going to round us out and, cl and close that up. Oh, well, no, I mean, I, 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 I agree with that. I think that it's, it's actually a little bit more insidious even than that. Um, uh, it's not just that white guys in journalism get all mushy about uh, white guys, but there's a basic idea that people who look like us should be comprehensible to us. Right. If somebody who doesn't look like the journalist does something incomprehensible, well, then they've done something incomprehensible. What do you, what do you want? You know, they're Muslim terrorists. It's in incomprehensible. Uh, but um, but if someone who looks like you does something incomprehensible, then it's your fault for not comprehending it. Which you know, I'm not uh, I'm not dis dismissing the project of comprehending the Trump voter. I'm actually working on that project. Um, I don't think that you know getting no, I, I, I and, agree. And, and, I totally agree. Is, is yeah. I don't think that's that's the way to to, to do it. Um, but I think that you know uh, what you're pointing to is 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 a really basic part of sort of identification and 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 the and the, and the way the journalists work, unfortunately. Yeah, there's a lot of <laughs> we won't go in there, but there's a, there's a lot of science on, on this, as you know. So. And I want to thank the two of you, and I want to say again, really, how critical your work is, both of you, your books, and it actually what you're doing actively also, in addition to this panel, thank you so much for being here, but actually to use language in intentional ways, as you say, and to give us a way to imagine the world in, in ways that are open-ended and more creative and not sort of say, I can't imagine this, therefore it doesn't exist, which is kind of a bit of a you know, defensive attitude. And I do want to recommend the two books out there, The Future is History, and then which ones of your books? I don't even know which one is out there. Is it um, a woman, women looking, looking at, at men, men looking, looking at, at women? women? If okay, you want yes. a 200-page essay on the mind-body problem, yes. I strongly recommend yeah. it. So, and thank you so much for um, being here on a Friday evening. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.